I love the wildflowers. It's recording now. Um, I'll start that all over again. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Now, um, I, uh, I, I don't know how it happened, but uh, uh, somewhere along the way, I accidentally fell in love with wildflowers, and it's been my longest, most successful relationship in my life. And I intend to stay actively in love with wildflowers for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to come in and celebrate this new chapter by um, sharing this love of plants. And, and you know, we live in a special place. Um, let's see. Uh, it's all supposed to work. Okay. We'll figure it out. And Southern Appalachia, it's magical. Um, this is the general area defined as Southern Appalachia. You can see my cursor, and we're right here um, with the Highlands Plateau and Cassius Valley. And all of this area is beautifully diverse. And um, one of the re main reasons that it has such high diversity is that we can find plants growing in the southeastern United States that you can find up in Maine and Nova Scotia and in, to Canada. So we're the southern end of northern plants and we're the northern end of southern plants and it's just such a beautiful place. And within this general big beautiful bit of diversity is the temperate rainforest of the Highlands Plateau. And it's just so, we are so lucky to get to live here and uh, we need to protect every, all, every bit of it that we can and, and make sure that we keep these special places special uh, for the sake of the water and the wildflowers and everything that's connected with it. Um, you know, uh, I don't know about y'all, but the winter time can be a real drag. You know, you're, you're just, uh, nothing's going on outside. There's nothing blooming. There's no flowers. Everything's dark and gray. It's a horrible, miserable time of year. And uh, you just, you know, tend to sit in front of a wood stove in a rocking chair, reading wildflower books and drinking bourbon. And then suddenly out of nowhere comes the return of a flower. Um, this is an emerging bud of a trout lily, what I call the very first wildflower of the year. And um, I will admit to uh, stalking the trout lilies and uh, the, the trout lily behind my head is um, probably from this same population as this old picture. And they are the first thing to bloom. And the day before they come up out of the ground, it is just winter forest floor, which is beautiful. And then out of nowhere, the wildflowers return and they bloom. This is a, a, a real uh, spring ephemeral, and it's a true ephemeral. It mostly stays above ground uh, for about three weeks or so, each individual plant. Um, it's not really the first wildflower of the year, and this goes back to a little conversation we were having before uh, uh, as people were joining, but um, this is could be typical, called the first wildflower of the year, and this tiny flower on a bed of moss is from a red maple tree. And um, I haven't been up onto the plateau in the last few days, but down uh, in the valleys and, and lower areas around Franklin and Silva, the red maple trees are blooming. And so this is the first thing that um, insects get to gather, start gathering pollen. And um, it's just such a, a beautiful thing. It's out of nowhere. It goes from the typical winter to this flush of color and life returns again and suddenly there's hope for the world and everything starts to become beautiful. And so uh, I try to spend as much time as I can out in the woods trying to find these uh, beautiful flowers. We get the trout lily, then uh, we get hepatica, um, which is the common name of liverwort. And that's this white flower right here. You can also find it in shades of pinks and such like that. And it's got really beautiful leaves that are up all winter long. Um, but these are some of the first blooms. They're very tiny uh, flowers and they can range from white to the pink and also rarely blue for this species. Um, up in Minnesota, they're mostly blue from what I've heard. So that's really interesting. Um, and they have such diversity within the species of differences. But it starts this progression, this progression of blooming that uh, 
I just want to follow it the whole time. And I want to see every flower. I want to see the first one. And then when um, for a long time, I'd be out in the woods and find these flowers. And my first instinct was to look around for someone to share them with. And, uh, you know, mostly that was just my dog and she wasn't really interested. Um, but uh, then it led to me, you know, accosting strangers in the woods saying, hey, want to see a pretty flower? Look at that flower. And, uh, you know, most people are frightened if a crazy guy comes out of the woods and says, come here, let it go look at the flower. Uh, now people uh, get to come on walks and that's what I get to do for a living. And it's a lot of fun. And I'll invite you all on some too. This giant flower filling your screen right now is the tiny, tiny flower called Spring Beauty. And what a beauty it is, isn't it? It's so small, um, and it has a uh, has the, when, from a distance until you get up close to it. It looks like the petals are completely pink, but when you get close, uh, they're whitish, frosty white with the pink stripes. And look at the pink anthers, which if you can see my uh, cursor here, that's the anther. That's where the pollen is, and it's the uh, pink pollen, and it has a relationship with a tiny wasp, no, a tiny bee, excuse me, which is the spring beauty bee that emerges at the same type of year and gathers this pollen. And that's, they have this relationship and they're only up for um, maybe four weeks in the spring. And they're so beautiful. I love seeing the big pictures though, because these, these flowers are so small. Um, they're really tiny and, and, Sometimes they're uh, everywhere around us and we don't even notice them. One of my favorite things in the world is to uh, walk people into a field of wildflowers that they haven't seen yet and show them one. And then watch as they look around and say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Oh, they're under my feet. You know, and sometimes um, we can go look at plants and we can go look for really rare things and special things that only happen in, say, uh, five counties, um, uh, three of them in North Carolina, and uh, maybe one each in South Carolina and Georgia, and that's the Oconee Bell. Um, or we can just find common things like this common blue violet right here, uh, which grows out in the yard if you don't mow, if you don't keep a meticulous lawn. If you do keep a meticulous lawn, I invite you to hang out after the talk, and we can talk about that in detail and how to get it. Uh, from lawn into uh, 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 an ecological wonderland for your plants. But um, this is the common blue violet. And not only is it a beautiful flower and very common, um, but it is a, a, a del delicious little snack. Mountain folk, Appalachian settlers would pick these and candy them by dipping them in sugar water or um, even going so far as to make a, like an egg white wash with sugar and paint it on there and they get all crystally and they would decorate cakes with the uh, the flowers. And I recommend in the spring, very soon when these start emerging, that you go out into your non uh, synthetic chemically sprayed lawn and yard and find these and put some in your flowers too, in your salad too, because uh, they're really delicious. And as you're picking these flowers, um, take some of the leaves. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the leaves of violets are not only delicious, but they're loaded with nutrition. Um, violet leaves contain five times more vitamin C per volume than an orange does. And while that, uh, it would take a lot of volume of violet leaves to make the same volume of an orange because they're light and skinny, but um, uh, five times more vitamin C plus the violet violet leaves have vitamin A and they have a uh, the orange doesn't have that they weren't grown in Central America or Southern California and uh, picked early and artificially ripened and shipped with fossil fuels but they get gathered for free in your yard uh, and this is a, a it's available to everybody and it's delicious and it has um, beautiful nutritional value including um, soluble fiber so Get you some violet leaves. Don't pick them all, though, because uh, the rabbits need something to eat, and the bees need some, too. 
Now, uh, a lot of people love landscaping and getting pretty flowers, and they'll go to the box stores or, um, you know, smaller local regional uh, nurseries, and they'll find flowers. And, and a lot of people love to buy geraniums and plant those things around. Um, I have news for you. You're like hardy geraniums and um, indoor geranium uh, houseplants and all those different things are uh, not really geraniums. They're not in the genus geranium. This flower right here is in the genus geranium. And this is the wild geranium. And it's such a beautiful plant. And uh, I think this is a really important addition to any shady uh, wildflower garden. Um, it has this really uh, beautiful uh, in clumps and it shines out those colors. Um, it, each flower only is open for a day, but this plant has a long bloom time because it actually has a succession of flowers ready to go when the last one, when the next one is done. So this one's in bloom and below here, you can see the last flower that was done. And then somewhere around here is a bud with uh, the next one to pop open. And it, so they seemingly bloom for a long time and they have beautiful leaves and texture. Um, you know, some of my flower pictures you could use for identification. That could go in a wildflower guide, you know, as the flower. Um, others are not so much. This thing right here, um, I love this picture though. This is actually this plant. This is foam flower. Tiarella cordifolia. So uh, I usually teach plants in common names and then I throw in Latin as needed. So Tiarella cordifolia, that's the genus and specific epithet or species name. Um, and the whole species is Tiarella cordifolia. Um, it's a beautiful plant. This foam flower is its common name and because it grows near the creeks and when there's a whole mass of them in bloom, it might look like foam on top of water or something, I guess is how it was named. But um, the beauty of the Latin name shines through in this plant and it shines through in this photo because Tiarella, the genus name, is related to the word tiara and Ella being a diminutive. So that makes Tiarella mean like a little crown and cordifolia means heart-shaped leaf. And while you can't see the heart-shaped leaf, this top-down view of that flower in bloom uh, definitely shows you it's crown-like and it's such a beautiful thing. Again, pink uh, anthers here with pink pollen. It's very interesting on these uh, white flowers. I guess maybe it stands out to the pollinators. There's our Oconee Bell, right? Here's to the Oconee Bell. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the Oconee Bell, except that um, its bloom time is very soon. It'll be very, very soon that it'll be in bloom. And uh, there's a famous saying that um, I think I'm obligated to say anytime you talk about the Oconee Bell, about this plant, why it's so rare, um, because it was uh, found and then discovered by European um, explorers and then lost to science and then rediscovered. And the, the quote is, um, it was found by a man who never named it, named for a man who never saw it, by the man who couldn't find it. And so there you go, I've, I've fulfilled my botanical obligation, but look how beautiful this flower is. And it's um, so delicate. And again, it's only found in five counties. Now there's another related subspecies that's been discovered up in, uh, I believe, Mitchell County. Um, and that's uh, this is the Shortia glassifolia. Shortia is named after John Short. So it was named after a guy who never found it. Short never saw this plant. Um, and then uh, Galassifolia would be translated to Galax-like leaf because the leaves look like Galax. Um, and they discovered uh, fairly recently, in the last 15 years or so, a new uh, population that is different, the uh, Shortia brevastyla. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so, said to be the rarest wildflower in North America. And then when you go down to the uh, Foothills um, Trail and, or the Oconee State Park uh, near Jokasi and uh, go see them and they're everywhere and they're in bloom, I highly recommend that. Um, this is a lovely flower. This is bloodroot. 
Blood root is sanguinaria canadensis. Sanguinaria means blood or related to the blood. And um, it's such a beautiful and delicate flower. And when they first come up, they uh, the, before this flower opens and exposes all the, the stamens and the pistil there in the center, uh, they look kind of like a, um, uh, they're, they're oval shaped and it looks like an egg, almost like an Easter egg. And it's this uh, top heavy, it's on this slender stalk. You can see the stalk right here. And then every time when they come up, the leaf, which is a single palmate or lobed leaf, looks like your uh, the lobe of your hand if you're looking at it, um, is actually folded up and wrapped around the stem. And it's there holding this delicate stem while this top heavy flower uh, begins to open up so it doesn't fall over. And then once the flower is open and blooming and sturdy, that leaf then unfurls and begins photosynthesizing. And it's such a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful spring flower, one of the iconic ones. Um, it used to be used internally by people. It was uh, used for toothpaste. They don't recommend doing things like that anymore. Um, should only be taken internally for um, uh, by under the direction of a medical herbalist. Uh, and externally, you got to be careful with it too. Now, Appalachian kids, mountain folk used to, uh, the, the kids would like use it to paint their faces or, or put on or pretend lipstick and stuff. And I don't recommend doing that because you can also use it to burn off warts and uh, skin tags. So really you want to uh, not dig this plant up and it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, the blood root is true. If you were to come across a rhizome, you can carefully dig out one in a big population and crack open a piece or scratch it and you can see it'll ooze red sap. Uh, this plant is in the poppy family. So um, don't sleep on this one in the springtime. Jack in the pulpit. You know, I don't have a good eye for finding these when even if I know they're around and I've had to train myself to look for their leaf, which is like a, a, a trillium, but it got scrunched up all on the one side. So it's three lobes. Uh, but once I do start to see them, you can see them and they're everywhere. Some people think this is a carnivorous plant because of the hood, but it's not. It's a, um, this is a spathe and that's a spadex in there. It's like the peace lilies that you see in places or the Easter lilies. And um, there's actually, uh, you know, this is Jack in the pulpit. And uh, that's, it's said to look like a preacher standing in the pulpit, but it's a very progressive church because um it's actually uh, could be Jack in the pulpit or it could be Jill in the pulpit because this is a type of plant that has two separate plants for uh, male flowers or female flowers. So it's monoecious or it lives in one house. And um, so the, uh, the, the, the flowers look the same from the outside. And the way that I used to be able to, um, only way I knew to tell was to open up and peer down into that tube and look for pistols or stamens. And um, uh, so it kind of felt a little rude, maybe like I was peeking up under their skirts and stuff. And uh, eventually someone taught me that um, uh, to look for the number of leaves. They have a, uh, a three-lobed leaf, but it's a single leaf, or it's uh, got two leaves. And it turns out that the um, single-leaved plants are male and the two-leaved plants are female. And the reason for that, many of y'all know this inherently, is that it takes more energy to be a female than it does to be a male. And so uh, all the male flower has to do is release some pollen and then it can just hang out in the forest um, or fall asleep or whatever. And then the, the female plant has to then accept the pollen and ripen the fruits and and have that energy as well so they have two leaves to be able to um take up twice as much solar energy down there um they're a really interesting plant though too and they don't really like me teaching this part in tennessee but i you know we're in north carolina so i think we're okay still um they actually because they have separate plants that are male and female some years in some populations, there'll be too many male plants and not enough female plants for to perpetuate the population. And so they actually can, um, when they go dormant, come up the next year and actually change the sex of the flowering plant. So they're um, 
gender fluid in their um, flowering, depending on the needs of the population, and they can go back and forth. And it's really interesting. Not every uh, flowering plant that has a separate can do that. So it's a really special plant. Look for it in the spring. Um, this is the foam flower. I'm going to speed up. I'm not going to tell every story about every flower because uh, we'll just stay here in the spring. But I want you to know everything that we're seeing right now is about to start blooming somewhere in the next two weeks, three weeks, and then they're going to be blooming for about a month. And then, then they go away. And if you miss it, if you don't take the time to go walk in the woods and walk these trails, you're going to miss seeing the uh, wind flower here. Uh, you don't want to rue the day of missing to see this plant. Wind flower, Thalactum thalactroides. It's also called the rue anemone. And it's such a beautiful plant. It has um, uh, most of the plants, uh, flowers in the early spring have white flowers. This one does too. The way you can tell this one is by its beautiful, soft, round lobed leaves um, that give it away as a thalactrum and related in that this uh, gene um, family. Thalic Anyway, um, but it has a single flower up top, and then there's at least two and sometimes three or four lateral flowers coming off to the side. And that's how you can tell it apart from some of the other smaller white blooming um, anemones. But the rune anemone is such a beautiful plant. Um, sometimes you have to lay on the ground to see the magical things that are so small. One of my favorite things about me being a giant of a person, really big, is that uh, I really love little tiny wildflowers. And this is the flower of um, uh, cucumber root or Indian cucumber root or uh, Mediola virginica. It's such a wonderful plant. And they kind of look like a uh, miniature trillium. And this one's hanging down there. Um, Solomon seal. Wonderful. Uh, Polygonatum. Fly florum is its science name. And uh, polygonatum is, uh, depending on what source you read, it means many knees. I think uh, poly polygonatum means something different. We can talk about that later. But um, by florum means two flowers. And so uh, it usually has two flowers dangling underneath these, these leaves. And they hang underneath, as opposed to the Solomon's plume, which has a, a cluster of flowers that stick out the end. And there's no flowers underneath. That's how you can tell those two plants apart. If you notice, this one has more than two flowers hanging at each at each node, because uh, this is the giant Solomon seal, and this is actually a a weird uh, genetic um, mutation that makes them really large and have a lot of flowers. It's a tetraploid. If you're into such things, uh, Bishop's cap. I love this plant. It's so tiny and delicate. Um, they look like little snowflakes at the end of a bell. And, and it's also called miterwort, bishop's cap. It has a, each plant is, is just a single stalk. These uh, two fused leaves that make it a uh, perfoliate or almost, I think they're still open right here, but um, these two leaves and then the stalk of flowers sticking up, multiple ones. They get pollinated by really small gnats and um, really small flies, uh, such a beautiful plant. And um, so Bishop's cap, miterwort, and its genus name, Mitella, it's Mitella diphyla. Mitella and miterwort, it seems that a miter is the name of the hat that a bishop wears in the uh, Catholic church and in the Episcopal church. And I had the, the fortune of giving a walk for a, a group of, uh, they were the spouses of Episcopal uh, of preachers in the diocese here. And uh, one of the ladies, her husband was is a bishop. And so she had the picture of him in his miter. And I got to see it. And it kind of didn't look anything like that. It, nothing. I don't know what people are talking about. But it's pretty funny how plants get their names, how they <laughs> their stories. Um, this is uh, the wake robin. Red erect trillium. Trilliums are magical, magical flowers. Um, they're not just the names for subdivisions, but they are beautiful, beautiful plants. They have a lot of variety and diversity in them. And there's actually a lot of um, scientific research going on in trillium erectums uh, right now. But this is um, 
the uh, red trillium, everything about trillium comes in three. So they have three leaves. They've got three flower petals, um, three sepals here behind the flowers. Uh, they're amazing plants. There's even three different general types of trilliums. So among the trilliums, you have erect trilliums, which are trilliums that are on a stalk. You can see the stalk right there at the base. And the flower is born above the leaves. You also have um, stalkless or sessile trilliums. This is like stinking Benjamin. Doesn't that sound great? Or the yellow trillium, um, trillium luteum where the flower doesn't have a stalk and it's just sticking up straight out of the trillium leaves. This is a trillium here. Um, and then you have nodding trilliums and they're such a, some of my favorites. This is painted trillium. It gets its name because as you can see, there's little reddish streaks. Looks like somebody just delicately used a paintbrush. This is trillium undulatum and I love that Latin name, trillium undulatum. It undulates. If you look, the flower petals and you can see it in the uh, leaf edges are all wavy, like potato chips. Um, they don't taste like potato chips. Don't eat them. Uh, but this is such a beautiful, beautiful flower. Um, this is the uh, one of the nodding trilliums. Nodding trilliums, they have a stalk like the uh, red erect trillium here and like this... Um, uh, painted trillium, but instead of them standing up above the leaf, their stalk nods down and you can find them under leaves. And in some of the uh, species of nodding trilliums, we have uh, three, I think, in the woods around us. Um, the leaves are so big that it covers the flower. And if you don't know it's there, um, you might just see a trillium leaf and think the flower got taken or maybe it just didn't bloom and you'd miss out on this one, this is the um, uh, Catesby's Trillium. It's named after uh, some old dead white guy botanist. Um, but really, one of its other common names is really wonderful, and I like it even better. It's called the Bashville Trillium. And it's the Bashville Trillium because it's like hiding under the leaves, and then it blushes pink because it's kind of embarrassed that you saw it. Um, we suddenly jump into the beginning of the later spring and transition in the summer. Now, this is bee balm. This is Monarda didyma or didyma. You know, um, the best advice I was ever given about pronouncing botanical Latin, and I really encourage everyone to take time to learn botanical Latin. It's such a beautiful thing and beautiful language, but um, uh, it's it's really fun to say once you once you get over like learning how to say it and learning about it. Uh, but the best advice I was ever given on how to pronounce things is pronounce botanical Latin names confidently. Just go for it. And then if you're in a room and people are saying it different, you might adopt what they say, but maybe not. Um, this is the scarlet bee balm. This is a hummingbird feeder. Um, I hope a lot of people, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are feeding birds and feeding hummingbirds. Uh, there is no better hummingbird feeder than the flowers that the hummingbirds evolved over millions of years um, to drink nectar from. And this is a really great one. Um, it's not the only bee balm in the woods too. You know, there's a bunch of different types and colors. They're all in the genus Monarda and then they have different second parts, uh, uh, scientific or uh, specific epithets. Um, like this is Didyma or Didyma, so I can spell it. But um, there's also others. This is uh, punctata. This is, um, or a different one. But this is uh, has uh, purple spots and is white. And uh, was lucky to catch this little um, fly here that's pretending that it's a bee, um, but really it's a fly, it doesn't sting. Hoverflies are really great pollinating insects. Um, there's basil bee balm, there's the white one. Uh, there's this pink one. This is actually a naturally occurring hybrid. Uh, Monarda media, media, some of her calling it. And then um, 
bunch of my friends with the Callaway Native Camp Conference, we uh, we call it um, Monarda uh, Concurrent Session. But uh, there's a part on the parkway. This is actually the parent. This is the child. It's a hybrid between a red um, bee balm and a white bee balm. And there's a spot on the parkway where you, both of those species are blooming. And this one is blooming right in between them. Um, it's one of the best wildflower gardens that nobody ever planted that you might see. Um, this is a familiar site to a lot of folks. This is um, from the top of Whiteside Mountain. Um, and uh, this is a beautiful uh, locust. This is, um, I like to call it clammy locust, but there's another one that really gets called that. Um, but this this is such a rare flowering plant right here. It's a locust tree. It doesn't get very tall. Um, Hartwig's locust is what this is called. I think it deserves a prettier uh, common name than that. We can make one up. There's no rules with that. Um, but it's only found on the high rock outcroppings in um, not only Southern Appalachia, but in the Highlands Plateau. This is a narrow, narrow endemic plant, meaning it doesn't grow all over the place. Um, but in a very, and you can go see this at the top of Whiteside um, every, every spring. It's so beautiful. Uh, come on, so many great wildflowers. Um, Sun drops is this plant's name. Again, it's one of these plants that has a long bloom time. Um, this is Onothera fructicosa, and it is related to evening primrose, but it, and so it's in the primrose genus and group and family. But um, this one is a full sun blooming. So instead of the evening primrose, which closes up at night um, or closes up during the day and blooms into the evening, uh, that this is blooming all day. So it's given the name sun drops. And it's such striking color. I think it could be used more in landscape um, if you can find it. If you're ever feeling sad or blue, all you gotta do is find St. John's wort in bloom and it'll cheer me right up. Um, not to make light of uh, mental health issues at all. In fact, St. John's wort, a couple of the species can be very effective medicines uh, to help people uh, in a natural way deal with um, you know, uh, anxiety and depression, um, it's a great thing. I think also going out in the woods and looking at flowers helps me with that. There are so many different St. John's warts. This is not one, this species that we're looking at wouldn't be used for medicine, uh, but I love it. This is the seed pods um, after the uh, the developing seed pods after and ripening over after the flowers are done. And I think they look like uh, squeezed up Hershey's Kisses and they're beautiful flowers, beautiful seed pods. Um, native plants are not just beautiful, but they are a foundation of an ecosystem everywhere around the world. They are the foundation of the ecosystem. They're the thing, the plants that grow around us are the thing that take solar energy and turn it into sugar and carbohydrates and food. And they've been doing it for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And over that time, they developed intricate relationships with insects, like these uh, bees. Well, actually there's one bee and then a bunch of these hoverflies pretending that they're bees. You can see their uh, little fly eye right there. Um, and then there's one of the bumbles. Uh, on this plant, you know, they, they, how long, I've been thinking too much lately about how long that has, does it take? And to trying to imagine the scope of time for the relationship of, say, that's uh, spring beauty bee and the spring beauty to develop and how easily and quickly it can be lost um, when overdevelopment happens or impacts. And, you know, we're dependent on this stuff. And so we can use native plants in our landscape and help turn that tide. You can have this action going on all summer long in highlands on a uh, on edges and in a border, because this is a great plant for anywhere in the Southeast really, but especially up in elevation, because around here, this is um, the uh, Southern bush honeysuckle, Southern bush honeysuckle. 
it only grows up above 4,500 feet pretty much in the southeast. Um, grows a little lower in elevation as you get up in latitude into the middle parts of northern Appalachians. But um, this is a great landscape plant. It takes pruning. It spreads and makes a little thicket and hedge. It's beautiful yellow flowers that are just covered up in pollinating insects and uh, has these great leaves, opposite leaves. Um, arching habit. Uh, no, I can't say anything more except I hope that you go buy some of these. Um, I wish you could buy this one. This is a scarlet paintbrush, also called Indian paintbrush. Um, and there's populations. This actually blooms on the uh, Highway 64 in between um, Cashers and Highlands on uh, the right-hand side of the road as you're headed from Cashers to Highlands. And it's in a very uh, tight curve where you can't stop and look at it, but you can check out the splashes of color. It's got beautiful um, leaves. And it's got boring little flowers. What? What the heck am I talking about? That's a beautiful flower, isn't it? Well, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, this is the Indian paintbrush. Um, and the flower is not the red. The flower are actually a green flower in a tube right here. You can see another one in the bottom corner. And then the red are actually modified leaves that are doing the job of uh, what flower petals do, which is to attract pollinating insects. And so um, they have a, a long bloom time because their uh, leaves just stay red and they look like they've been dipped in paint. This is actually a um, very interesting plant. Um, it's a what's known as a hemiparasite. It has um, the ability to make photosynthetic energy itself and it's connected up in the ground through the soil to um, the roots of trees near it. No, I'm sorry, grasses with this one, where it um, shares their abundance of energy, sugar and carbohydrates in this um, underground connected mutual benefit relationship with three different, four different or more different species of uh, and types of organisms. It's really amazing. There's a few plants that do that. And then there's plants that eat stuff. This really pretty flower was actually taken, this photograph was taken along the boardwalk at the Highlands Botanical Garden at the Biological Station behind the Nature Center. One of the real treasures within the treasure of Highlands is this botanical garden. And I hope that y'all just take advantage of its proximity, go walk it, celebrate with them, donate a bunch of money to them, participate in all their events. And uh, it's a really wonderful thing. These are the flowers of the carnivorous pitcher plant. Um, and uh, it's really funny because they get pollinated by some of the same insects that they eat. So uh, they actually have to stick their uh, flowers way up high so that if they get pollinated before they eat the insects, otherwise they would undo themselves. Um, this flower is really cool. I just, I met this one for the first time just a, two years ago, and this is the gray's lily. And it grows on Roan Mountain. Um, Gray's lily is beautiful. The Turk's cap lilies, here's the Turk's cap lily. You can see that they're similar, but there's got great differences. The Turk's cap lily is probably the, one of the most iconic summer wildflowers in Southern Appalachia. It's really amazing. Um, it doesn't stop, but uh, in, in the early parts of July, uh, I encourage you to go on to the Blue Ridge Parkway at the Balsam Mountain entrance and head up in either direction, but specifically towards the Asheville Way, which is um, north on the parkway. Um, and the Turks cap lilies are blooming along the side of the road in such abundance that you want to be very careful you don't drive off the road. And that's a message to myself. And there's just so many of them. There's in the shady areas, there can be a lily, lily that looks just like this, but it's smaller um, and has just one flower or so. And the way you can tell the Turk's cap lilies, if you look into the center of this flower, each orange petal, when it goes into the inside, has a green triangle. And then all together, they make the form of like a star. And the Carolina lily or Misha's lily doesn't have that one. But when you see them in full sun, and they have the ability to make as much energy as they want. And they put off all those flowers. 
they're going to be 20 flowers on the top of it blooming. Um, it's just an amazing progression of plants and relationships. And we live in such a special place. Um, outside of the tropics, we're among the most highly biodiverse places in the world. And, um, and there's a lot of really important things. This is a, a butterfly that's named after a wildflower. Um, this is a butterfly that's named after the pipe vine, the Dutchman's pipe. This is the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. And it's drinking nectar on green-headed coneflower, Rudbeckia laciniata, which um, everyone can have Rudbeckia laciniata growing in their yards. And they, they not only get this beautiful wildflower to feed beautiful butterflies, but we can eat the leaves of Rudbeckia laciniata because the Cherokee call that uh, plant Soshan. And, and it's been a part of their um, uh, sustainable regenerative agricultural approaches for tens of thousands of years. Um, so many beautiful flowers. Come on, yellow fringed orchid, purple fringed orchid. Um, down here on the right is an orchid that's so tiny. Um, it just makes me smile because this whole, each individual flower is tiny, this whole cluster. So this is a strawberry leaf in comparison. It's, un, it's under and next to a strawberry leaf. This is the uh, kidney leaf tway blade orchid. And, um, it's just the smallest thing. I can't even show, my fingers are too big and clunky to even show you in person how small each individual flower is. Um, and if you don't know that they're there and you're just walking along, you won't see them. And so I encourage you to take the time to walk in the woods. I encourage you to stay active and participate with the uh, North Carolina Native Plant Society as a whole. They have state conferences. Um, they're big players and participants for many, many years throughout the whole history, uh, almost the whole history of the Cullowee Native Plant Conference, which is third week of July. But put this into your calendars right now. April 1st is when we go live with the Cullowee Native Plant Conference. For those that don't know, that's the largest, oldest native plant conference in the country. And we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this summer. Um, third week of July, but April 1st is when the conference goes live and you can register. And if you want to go on a field trip, you better sign up on a, don't be a fool and miss out on going on a field trip and signing up because um, we actually sold out of everything last year. And that was the 39th year. Um, in the meantime, come walk in the woods all season long, all through to the, till the fall when the asters are blooming and the goldenrods start rotting and the gentians are going. And I invite you to come on a walk with me to um, Bigelow's Botanical Excursions. I can take you to see all of these flowers, almost all of these flowers and locations and tell you so many stories and help connect you with nature. Um, it's such a beautiful thing to celebrate. I'm honored to have been shown and taught all these things over the years and to get to share it. And I invite you, I do, um, weekly wildflower walks every most every Friday between March and October. And uh, they're every Friday we move to a different trailhead. Each walk is three hours and often while walking in the woods and I'm talking about plants and, and we're sharing the stories. Um, and we've been walking and learning about plants for two and a half hours and it's time to go home. We're about 20 minutes back to the car. There are wildflower walks, some of the best ones you can actually see your car the entire time. And um, so they're accessible to many people. They're short and gentle. I offer them on a sliding scale of between $15 and $50 per person. So I invite you to pay whatever you feel like is valued, whatever you can. And it helps uh, with people that may not be able to afford it. And I just want more and more people to be aware because if you don't know something's there, um, if you, you walk right by some of these things or you think they're just weeds and if you don't know something's there, um, you can't love it. And, the, and if you don't love it, why would you care if it's there? And I'm trying to stay on time. I think um, I just hit 46 minutes. And I just want you to know that I could just keep talking for the next three hours. Um, I love these flowers so much. 
I hope that uh, you celebrate and share your love of it with the chapter participate. And I'm grateful for everyone involved in starting up this, um, including myself uh, as a founding member of the Coney Bell chapter of the North Carolina Native Wildflower Society. And I'm saying that also now in an official capacity because there's another potential membership uh, or partnership because I'm uh, also the uh, vice president of a regional chapter of a nationwide organization called Wild Ones that's devoted to um, celebrating the use of native plants in the landscape and celebrating um, and teaching about sustainable landscaping practices. And so uh, we look forward to working with y'all and um, having a lot of fun and, and saving the world by planting native plants in our landscapes. And I thank y'all for your time. Um, Thanks, Adam. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Amazing nice preview before it happens. Adam, yeah, it's all about to happen. Very proud of you. It it's is, always it great to listen all... to you, Adam.